To take the Milky Way, our friendly neighborhood galaxy, has about 100 billion stars. That's a lot of stars, but it's a big place. The brain has about 100 billion cells. It's exactly the same number, but it's squished into things about the size of two fists pushed together like this. Some years ago, it was like, wow, you know, the adult brain can do stuff, but, you know, like, okay, been there, done that. We all, <laughs> we're not so impressed by that anymore. What, what we would, I guess, like to know is how much can you learn? How does it work? You can speak as many languages as you want, but interpreting is really different. Because when you interpret, you, you have to render very correctly the message that you hear, and it's really a special skill. A baseball player has created a model in his brain. He understands what perfection was. So he's continually using information that he has from the immediate past and from the distant past to make little corrections in how his movement trajectories are gonna be controlled to hit the ball. So he's gotta move his whole body and memory comes powerful to play when you're mastering a skill or ability like that. You're either reading music or remembering, and you're executing these techniques and getting nuances and, and just holding it correctly, you know, just there's a lot going on. It seems as if it's probably like exercise, you know, you, you don't do it for a day, you really feel it. And um, you feel, and then two days, it's exponential. You are a specialist, just like that musician, just like that baseball player, just like that simultaneous interpreter. You're manipulating information in complicated ways in your head. The mathematics abilities that you have are superior to 99% of people a thousand years ago. You don't think about it, but that's neurological specialization. Each of us has spent a lifetime developing the expertise that makes us unique. We create our competencies through effort until what we work at becomes automatic. But unless we continually strive to retain our skills, they'll be lost. As we'll see in the case of experts, how they engage their plasticity and refine their performance is not unique. Rather, it is an ability that lies within the neurology of all of us. The latest research in neuroscience and the experience of experts will show us how. Coming up on Brain Fitness, peak performance. While many questions about the brain remain unanswered, a critical mass of scientific studies have demonstrated our brain can be physically and functionally changed throughout our lives based on how it is utilized. As this change occurs, our brains become specialized in the skills that we practice. The ability of the brain to change is called neuroplasticity, and it takes place throughout our lives. Neuroplasticity is common to the entire lifespan. These skills can be improved through experience and through really sort of simulating and, and training these abilities. But this translates into a lot of different things that actually are involved in the real world, not on the sports field. Things like driving, your ability to sort of really rapidly respond to unexpected things that are happening. Um, so if sort of any situation uh, where the visual world is coming at you and you're not able to predict exactly where things are and how you will respond, those are skills that, that you can improve and that, and that are very similar to what athletes are doing. My mantra is, is that every skill and ability that we have in a refined set is a product of brain remodeling. It's a great human trick, right? It's our ability to adapt as culture changes. It's the great human ability. It's our incredible adaptability. We call that brain plasticity. New science about how the body and the brain work together in the study of body maps sheds new light on building peak performance. You know that you've got a mind's eye? Well, you have a mind's body in the same way. So your body is mapped by your brain. Like a road atlas, your brain is full of maps that represent all aspects of your physical self, both inside and outside the body. But unlike road maps, your body maps are dynamic. They can grow or shrink dependent on use. It's laid out on a sheet of cortical tissue. Your space around your body is mapped out to the end of your fingertips. If you hold a tool like a cane, or a baseball bat, the mapping from your body goes out to the end of the tip of the bat. 
when you're playing in cyberspace, the brain maps are actually co-opted into cyberspace. Body parts are mapped based on touch receptors in your skin, forming your primary touch map. There's also a motor map for movements derived from signals sent from your brain to your muscles. The experience shapes your brain and it shapes these maps. And people used to think that once you had these maps, and I mean, I mean all the maps, visual, everything, then your brain was set. And the reason they thought that was because of stroke. People would have a big, massive stroke and they would have paralysis and it wouldn't come back. The maps are plastic throughout life and you can find ways to kickstart them. If the injury is not so extensive, uh, you can use a lot of techniques to bring the function back. And one of the very exciting things about stroke rehabilitation these days is that they have found all these ways to reanimate these maps. Through daily practice and concentrated effort, we turn abilities into expertise. We can become experts at something that requires very specific training, like playing an instrument. But it also means we become experts at anything to which we pay concerted attention. I don't care almost who you are, you probably mastered the ability to control a machine moving at high speed, operating in an environment of other machines that are moving at equally high speed. Incredibly complex environment in which you don't run into one another and you know where you're going and you get there. And you get there safely almost every time. That skill is acquired through intensive practice, which leads to large-scale brain changes. When you've mastered it, your brain is not the same brain. With directed attention and practice, we can develop incredible levels of expertise. One of the more exacting skills that humans learn is that of language. While mastery of any language is a challenge, fluency in two languages is even more difficult. Dr. Michael Merzenich, renowned neuroscientist, sought to find an example of highly developed expertise in language and found Mariana Matakova, a simultaneous translator for the United Nations. So language has these kind of um, abstract and computationally demanding attributes. And so one of the things we, of course, have to try to understand is how that's supposed to work. So I can take your eardrum and I can go wiggle, 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 and that has to get translated into neuronal signals, and those have to then make contact with stored information. But it's actually quite demanding, and it's especially demanding if we think about the simultaneous translation case. If you get inputs all the time, continuously, and you have to find all the things in your dictionary, not just do you have to find the right words, but you have to then translate it into the right grammatical structure. So it's a remarkably complicated task. Simultaneous interpreters work throughout the United Nations to convey critical information across different languages, grammar structures, and cultures in a rapid and exacting manner. If you just say word by word, and in various languages you have very complicated structures, so it might not make sense in your uh, delivery language if you simply render word by word what's been said. Let's say she's interpreting from uh, spoken English to Russian. So the first thing that, ha that happens is she listens to the input stream, which is somebody saying some you know, very important uh, sequence of sentences. States, ...and it is essential that this is recognized and understood. So she just gets a bunch of vibrations in her ear. She has to break those into chunks of sound, translate those into the right brain code, and then make contact with the stored information. It's not enough just to look up the words and string them together. You have to look up the words, string them together, hold them in memory, and then construct the relationships between the words that are governed by their grammatical knowledge of the speaker. So, in some sense, the really incredible achievement of the brain in general, like her brain in particular for this kind of task, is the way to flip back and forth between stored information. So it's in some sense kind of the miracle of the memory system. Mariana also utilizes a very powerful organizational memory. The trick for a, a simultaneous interpreter like Mariana is you have to do it continuously. All the time, and not just I recognize the thing, but I recognize, I recognize, I recognize, and I string together and I embed in grammatical knowledge. So it's a fantastic skill. 
I, th I think you, you can say that that you are using uh, all your all your resources and you feel exhausted uh, after um, after a speech. I have better reaction when I'm actually under pressure of finding the right synonym and the right expression. Rather than if somebody asks me on the street, how do you say this in Russian? I said, I would start going into, there are actually there are three different ways. It all depends on what context you mean this and how you would like to express yourself. Do you want to be polite, less polite? This is very exciting and, job. And in, many, in many instances I have uh, goosebumps uh, when I'm interpreting and I enjoy it very, very much. Simultaneous interpretation is an incredible skill that comes out of a massive level of practice. This practice leads to a brain that is substantially different from the brain of an ordinary individual. Dr. Merzenich brought Mariana to a lab at New York University to illustrate the differences. When a simultaneous interpreter hears language, they hear it with a bias to one hemisphere, and when they produce the language, they have a stronger shift towards using the second hemisphere. So they actually divide the activities in their brain much more evenly across the two hemispheres. So the machinery they evolve, the machinery that they have in their brain, is different from yours or mine. Well, first of all, we know that they substantially suppress in their brain the sounds of their own voice. Another beautiful thing that you just cannot do, she represents the first language predominantly when she's simultaneously interpreting in one hemisphere. Now you listen and talk out of the same side of your brain, but she doesn't have to do that. So they have a kind of double brain for keeping these processes separate. After all, think of what they have to do. They have to very accurately take in language that's occurring in high speed and not just accurately hear it, and, but to interpret it and then not just repeat it word for word, but to translate its meaning. So if you look down in the brain of someone doing that, what you see is much more strong and balanced activities in the two hemispheres. To accomplish interpretation at a high rate of accuracy requires very strong attention the first principle of peak performance. It's quite difficult in the beginning because you, you are used to being uh, very attentive and doing something, uh, something single, one thing. But here you have to do several. And now I think it comes automatic. I realize now that my, my attention span is very good during half hour period. And that's very, very difficult to concentrate. Uh, my brain uh, adapts itself to, to what I choose to do. I find this quite special. To facilitate the incredible speed with which she processes, the brain of the interpreter utilizes prediction, another principle of peak performance. I always have an image of a skier. He goes this way and I follow him. This is like a speaker and I hear the voice, I hear the speech and I um, probably still divide it into little segments and these are these little segments that I'm interpreting. Although sometimes you have to uh, let the speaker um, run away from you to some extent because you need to grasp the whole meaning. If you think about a simultaneous interpreter, there's an unbelievable ability to follow the predictions of the ongoing speech, and you can see that they have a special sensitivity to the expectation of what those words are. They're making very strong ongoing predictions, and they're doing that because that's part of what gives them the stable ability to operate and flow in these two languages. Like any skill, interpreting must be practiced, which is a critical ingredient to maintaining expertise. You, you have to first develop a, a way of, uh, of listening and, uh, and talking at the same time and there are various exercises that, you, that help you to do that. And then you just master and you go from uh, easier texts to more complicated ones, uh, from slower ones to, more, uh, to faster ones and yeah, and then basically you, you, have, you have very basic idea of what you're supposed to do in your life work is your lifelong learning because it is always something new coming up, something unexpected. She wants to block off being able to hear the English that she's putting out so that she can hear the things she's translating. And that's quite a, a skill, actually, um, to be able to suppress all those mechanisms that I study, really want to be there and monitor your speech. But she's learned to sort of redirect that processing. One of the exercises is to, to get to the speed to be able to speak very quickly because you have to deliver a lot of information in a very um, short number of, uh, of seconds. And one of the exercises is to repeat after radio what's being said. Like this, you uh, you develop this uh, parallel, uh, two parallel processes because on one hand you listen and you talk and when you talk it shouldn't interfere with what you listen because after you've said this sentence you have to continue with a new one. 
Mariana experienced firsthand how lack of use can affect a skill after taking four months maternity leave. And I didn't have time to practice uh, when, I, when I had babies because you, your hands are full somehow. Um, and I, I was very worried, would I be able to interpret again? I did prepare before I came back, about two, three weeks before I started doing sight translation. This is when I would have a text in front of me and I would uh, read it and at the same time interpret into, into Russian. And I was doing that and I was quite slow, but uh, then quite quickly it, it went back to normal and I, I got my reflexes uh, and automatisms back and I was very happy. It's not that she's doing some amazing memorization of things. It's just that the way her, her brain is organized in a way that reflects this incredible capacity to store complex information and let it form relationships between sets of representations without actually trying to do anything. We know that as soon as she's in the process of listening, she has developed a machinery that's basically setting up the production in the second language for her interpretation of what she's hearing in the first language. So she has this machinery not just in her brain, but she has it tuned up. She has these processes elaborately refined. She can do this for conceivably hour after hour after hour, the simultaneous, you could say, sort of double-brained activity of listening in one language and talking in, in the second. What a marvelous thing that is. Turning everyday activity into expertise requires time and concentrated effort. Building up to the level of expertise like that of a professional musician requires strong application of the principles of peak performance. I try to do something every day, even if it's just sight read for half an hour or 10 minutes. That's so different than practicing for five hours one day and then not for the rest of the week. You're just developing motor skills and muscle memory. When I'm on that kind of path, my improvement goes up quite a bit. The ability of the brain to change shows up in very pronounced ways in the musician's body maps. If you practice and practice and practice at something, you will have a larger body map as you acquire the skill. And then as you become really adept at the skill, the body map will become more and more refined and become smaller. And then as you become even more expert, it will get bigger again. So let's say you're learning to play the violin and you're learning the fingering of the violin. You can study the size of the finger maps literally in the human brain. After a week of practice, you can size them again and they'll be bigger. Then as you get more skilled, as you're Itzhak Perlman, they get bigger, but only in this hand. Dr. Merzenich went to a lab at the University of California, San Francisco, to see how a musician's brain might differ from that of an ordinary individual. If, for example, we consider the case of a, a flutist or a woodwind player that has quite remarkable simultaneous use of the two hands. If we just look in their brain, we see that the hands are large in representation. And there's a much more elaborate representation, both on the sensory side and on the movement control side of their hands. Lying on my back with my head inside of a giant magnet, it's very strange. <laughs> One of the tasks we did was a score reading task where the musician uh, was flashed for three seconds a musical score with two refrains, and then it flashed a black screen again, and when the score went away, they sang the melody. The intent here was to look at a task which can only be done in musicians, and trained musicians can do it better. We were hoping to observe the visual aspects of, uh, of reading a score and translating that into motor production and uh, we ended up uh, observing more interesting things. We also ran a melody reproduction task, and we were hoping to look at the audio motor network. What we were trying to get at with these three experiments is to say, from what we know about how the brain works, what kind of experiments can we direct at really exposing some key things that are different in musician brain than in non-musician brain? And, and so one of the most salient are these novel associations between one sensory modality and a different motor effector. What you hear and what your hand does, there aren't normally activated neural pathways between those two regions. But in the musician case, with practice, those connections strengthened and developed. 
I definitely feel differently when I'm liking the way I sound. It's like this total positive feedback loop where I'm feeling more confident because things are going the way that I want them to, and then I'm able to do more good things. The brain of a professional musician is firing and wiring together very complicated sequences. From reading music and accurate listening to the complex series of muscle movements and breath control that they require. And each time, feedback supports these sequences. When the musician hits the right notes, for instance, changes in the brain are strengthened. Strengthening these connections involves complex chemical reactions inside the brain which release tiny neuromodulators like dopamine, acetylcholine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, which help to cement the relationship. One of the things about expert performance is that you, in the musician case, if you're doing a particular task a lot, like in this case playing a flute, then you're using some articulator, your hands, a lot more in a particular task than a non-musician would use. And so we would expect to see enhanced and enlarged representations of the fingers, in this case, in response to sensory stimulation and movement. And in the case of Michael, we also have a beautiful elaboration of the representation of the anterior face. Now, we looked at the lips. But if we were to look at the tongue, we'd also see that, especially for tongue protrusion, that little tip of his tongue is a lot fancier in the brain in how it's representing detailed information in yours or mine. And of course it is, because think of what it has to do. He has to be able to thrust it and retract it at very high rates in a very refined way, all kinds of subtle distinctions, not just the lips to generate the sounds, but to control the sounds in their perfection and make all of the little subtle adjustments that keep him on tune and that basically allow him to introduce vibrato and other aspects in the character of the music, which are so critical to its beauty. Taken together with all our tasks, uh, we were pleasantly surprised to observe uh, what we think is uh, reflective of uh, mirror neuron circuitry. Mirror neurons are basically neurons that are activated when you're perceiving an action, not necessarily doing the action. So normally, when you do these tasks, you design them so that you have what you expect to be when the subjects are processing information and then they're preparing and holding things in memory and then they're moving things. In this musician, when they're listening to melodies or looking at a musical score, very early on, they're actively uh, activating motor cortex of the hand and, and, the, and the mouth. And these activations of these motor regions persist until they make the movement. In this case, a musician has an association between moving the hands and the lips and hearing musical sounds. So there's this relationship between sound and hands and arms that you and I wouldn't automatically have in our brain. What was perhaps most interesting is we picked among the many control subjects who are non-musicians in the lab, and we compared head to head the response of the thumb in the musician with this control subject. We found that when you stimulate the thumb, somatosensory cortex in the musician was much higher than we observed in the control subject. So you can see here, when we compare a musician versus non-musician, in this case, the color scale represents the degree of activation, and we see increased activity in the musician. Memory is also a critical component of a trained musician's expertise. You can actually take a musician and you can ask them to play a piece of music in their mind, and then you can ask them where they are in the music as time passes. They can point to the place on the score, and it's just as if they were playing it. So they have a capacity to remember these long sequences of music on the score, music and sound, music and motion. And one of the reasons they remember it so well is because they have these three resources and they integrate and use them all. If you could just do that with everything you remember, you would be remembering things a lot better. This precise level of skill of a musician is also achieved through intensive practice. It's like a physical exercise for me, so if I'm not keeping it up, then I don't like how I sound and it's, it's not pleasurable to do it. I mean, a perfect analogy is the last couple of weeks I started exercising after not having done anything for a month. And the first 10 days of exercising were miserable. And then finally on the 11th day, I started having fun again. And it's exactly the same thing for me with playing the flute. With practice, 
these enhanced representations we see, a bigger signal comes back from the imager in thumb motor cortex, for instance. That means that there's a larger patch of neural real estate being devoted to the thumb. The size of what's devoted to the thumb really does depend on the, the amount of practice. You know, at the end of a long work day, all I really want to do is play because it's fun. It's, you know, it's what I am passionate about, so it's what I want to do all the time. Passion contributes greatly to their ability to refine their skills through motivation. The intense use of working memory and sequential reconstruction that these musicians perform gives them great advantages for their brain in the rest of their life as well. There's a lot of ways in which these, what we call, like task-specific skills would carry over into other tasks. If you have these novel associations uh, between a sense modality and a motor modality, then you have an additional way of encoding what you're hearing translates to being better able to remember something because you're kind of repetitively coding this in your head. Even if you forget in one representation, you still have this other representation. Especially in, in my view, if there is a panacea for any prophylactic effect against cognitive decline for aging or otherwise, I would say it is music. Because music has many important components that are uh, relevant to enhanced uh, representations and enhanced efficiency of processing uh, that is necessary for uh, everyday cognition. It has reward structures in place. Music is rewarding. It has also the anti-reward structure. Bad music makes you feel miserable, so you want to get better. Music is by nature very fast and dynamic and makes you be fast and efficient as both as a listener as well as for producing music. These are things that you need for everyday cognition. I think that music and learning music is, can be done for anybody at any age, and it's going to be really, really valuable to retaining their, uh, their cognition throughout their life. I am a baseball player. I love baseball. They seem like such simple skills. You imagine that anyone could do it, but in fact, these are incredibly difficult skills and abilities. In order to hit it, you have about approximately a tenth of a second. If you haven't made a decision about whether you're going to hit it or not in a tenth of a second, forget it. You are not going to hit it. So a baseball player is going to make that decision not just about anything, but actually about the flight and trajectory of something not necessarily straight. Now, in order to hit it, the baseball player has to initiate the movement of the bat, and the bat has to hit the ball with a very, very small margin of error. Now, how do you learn this ability? You learn it through thousands and thousands and thousands of practice tries, in which you're making these judgments about the flight of the ball in these few tens of milliseconds. And you're determining, basically, how the ball is arcing and moving towards you so that you can make that incredibly fast judgment. You can only do that through a massive period of practice because you have to strike it almost perfectly. I think one of the main things that's really being found nowadays is that experience is driving and really is what separates the, the top players from, from the rest of us. All of these guys have these amazing physiques, they have the biomechanics, they have corrected vision, yet you still see variability across these athletes. And our belief is that these demands that are a little bit harder to measure and things that maybe we aren't recognizing as much, which are occurring in the brain, is happening in this kind of hand-eye coordination networks. And the more honed they are, the better these players are. Developing the incredible skill required to make split-second decisions and act upon them requires tremendous attention. When you're at bat, what are you thinking about? Usually for me, it's the task at hand. You know, what's the situation when I walk up to the plate? So I try to leave everything else in the on-deck circle. The more you focus on one thing, the less you notice everything else. You know, if you're focused on what you need to do, you don't hear the guy in the third row yelling at you. In a way, it does block everything else because you give your mind something specific to focus on. Once you enter the batter's box, it's just you and the pitcher. Um, I don't play against anyone else while I'm hitting. So when I'm hitting, it's just me and the pitcher, so no one else matters. I do think that attention is really at the core of skill acquisition because 
the brain has to be in a state to really learn. Now, the brain is a success-driven machine. So if you imagine for a baseball player, if they fail, their brain is gonna reweight things and, re and try to adjust. And this is where the plasticity comes into it because it's constantly trying to adjust and say, how do I adapt so that the next time I face that situation, I'm gonna be able to, to succeed. And each one of these situations is really a plasticity driving situation. So the role that attention really plays in specifically developing these skills is really the ability for the player to first focus in on what's most relevant to them, be able to suppress the irrelevant information, which is a hugely important thing, but then also to focus in on not only the things while the pitch is occurring, but even things that are happening before, looking for small little cues. In all of these situations, these players have thousands of different things that could be occurring, right? Tons of different pitches could be coming at them. And what they have to do is use whatever information they can to filter it down and you're either gonna commit and swing or you're not gonna commit. Attention is so incredibly important in that because you really have to focus in on what's relevant and really shut down almost like a spotlight. The really great experts are the people that work harder, 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 harder. That's sort of the elbow grease to the whole thing. I don't, there's no way around that. The more you practice the right way or specifically, the more likely you are to execute those things. So, you know, a, as a player, as a hitter, as a fielder, whatever it may be, you have to practice the finer points to be able to execute them more often. Developing visual motor skill requires solving a lot of problems and linking vision with action and the ability to sort of make that not only more accurate but also more rapidly deployed and then actually it becomes very automatic so this sort of transition from cognitive to very automatic is sort of at the basis of acquiring a skill and really the main way to do that is through practice and actually putting yourselves in these situations to learn. The football coach Vince Lombardi once said that practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect and that's really getting at the sense that not all practice is created equal and especially at the brain level you really have to focus on almost the ability to anticipate the unexpected which is really difficult and the only way to do that is through extended hours of practice. Development of expertise also leans heavily on memory. Think of memories as these almost very explicit and declarative memories, but there's also other forms of memories which are more, more implicit and often called procedural memories and that's what actual skill is. It is a memory. It takes about a third of a second for a fast The batter has to make a decision about swinging in about one fortieth of a second. If the batter swings a thousandth of a second too soon or too late, he hits a foul. Players bring to bear a lot of information about past experience as they're preparing for on-field action. So when a player is stepping up to the plate, he's not stepping up as a blank slate. He's drawing upon a lot of knowledge about previous situations, the current pitcher, what the current context is, things like the count, what the score is, what type of hit he's trying to get. And that allows him to use this sort of past experience to form predictions which actually allow players to be able to sort of anticipate things and therefore within that really short window of time they're able to act, to actually have sort of an edge in being able to increase their level of success. Accomplishing that requires intense amounts of motivation as well. I mean, my motivating factor is this. I love the game of baseball. I think it's the hardest sport out there. It's a lot more fun to be successful. So that's why you practice. And it's one of those self-feeding cycles. The more you're successful, the more you're gonna keep it up. Interacting with a lot of players, it, it was really blown away by how hard they actually work and how dedicated they are to the actual skill development. And obviously, this has been a lifelong goal for them. And motivation is really key to develop any skill, but it's very, very important at the brain level because motivation leads to engagement. And the engaged brain is a learning brain. And if you don't have that sort of critical engagement with what you're doing, you're not setting the stage for the brain to be very plastic and to pick up the skills. Another important facet of peak performance is the concept of use it or lose it. Continual practice of gradually increasing difficulty is necessary to drive positive plastic changes in the brain. This game here is a, is a game about timing totally. A uh, matter of inches, timing, all of that play a part. Of a pitcher throwing 95 miles an hour and you haven't seen that and that's your first at bat, it, it takes some time to adjust in your eyes and everything getting back. If you're going two, three years and trying to play, it's, first, your defense gets away from you. Any athletic skill 
actually really generalize to skills that we employ every day. So maybe on the global level, being able to kind of sustain your attention, really focus on the task at hand, you get better at that as you put yourself in that situation. Neuroscience focused on kind of how we can train these things, but most importantly, how they will change your life is that you're going to be more attentive, you're going to be able to react faster and better in situations of uncertainty, and these are incredibly important in everyday life. Experts, like a simultaneous interpreter, a baseball player, and professional musicians, have shaped their brains and honed their skills through intensive practice to achieve incredible feats of specialization. But this ability for significant change is not limited to experts. We are all specialists at the skills we practice on a daily basis, whether it's driving a car or using a computer. To make the most of our own peak performance as we age, we need to stay both mentally and physically active. Exercise is critical to maintaining high-functioning brain fitness. Elderly participants with the uh, predisposition for Alzheimer's, that, that is, that are APOE4 carriers, if you contrast uh, elderly participants that are vigorous exercisers, just physical exercise or not, you get a clear early distinction in cortical responses to things that are later affected in Alzheimer's. So physical exercise seems to have very clear potential neuroprotective effects. So one should certainly encourage that. In an experiment done in the late 90s, which was uh, very clever, they took cancer patients who were terminal and who had, of course, given their consent to the experiment. And they labeled their brain neurons with a particular dye that was incorporated only in dividing cells, in other words, only in cells that were making more of themselves. And this is something that, of course, cancer cells do all the time. After the patients passed away, their brains were examined, and it turns out that a number of neurons in the brain had taken up this dye, and that was prima facie evidence that, in fact, new neurons were being born in the brain. And just to underline, these were elderly people. They were in their 50s and 60s and 70s. So even once you are well past the age of Medicare, your brain is still forming new neurons. And then the question is, under what circumstances does it do so, and can you speed it up? And there the answer turns out to be yes. But surprisingly, you speed it up. It's not by doing crossword puzzles till you're you know, cross-eyed, but instead through physical activity. Something as simple as an hour of aerobic exercise five times a week will dial up the rate of production of new neurons in the brain. So there's you know, hope for all of us yet. The same principles of exercise are important for the brain, and daily continual maintenance through practice is critical. Let me stop a physical activity that we've mastered. It could be anything. Maybe I've mastered playing the piano. I don't think of my giving it up as having neurological or mental consequences. I think of it as being all physical. But you have to understand that they're also, in a sense, mental and neurological things that you're giving up and they contribute to the refinement of the processing of information in your brain back from your senses. You're operating in vision, you're operating with all sorts of feedback that's coming from your body that's controlling your movement in all of these wonderful and refined ways. And you're giving up practicing that. And of course that will generalize to the other aspects of your life. So there are of course neurological consequences of giving up all of the skills or abilities that have made you the interesting person that you are. Well you know intuitively that you should be mentally exercising. I mean, you just don't know what to do, but you know intuitively that if you don't, just, just as if you give up physical exercise, there will be losses. Physical and mental activity are important components of healthy aging. An often overlooked but equally important aspect of brain fitness is remaining socially connected. We are by our nature social creatures. And if there's anything that's important to keep alive, to keep in good shape, by appropriate practice. It's to maintain our high faculties in our ability to interact positively socially with other people around us. While the brain seeks out the new and novel, plasticity is a two-way street and can be driven both positively and negatively. Not all lessons that we learn affect our lives beneficially. By actively challenging ourselves, we can combat negative plasticity. Though sometimes in the modern world, those active challenges can be more difficult to find. Basically, we know that taking it easy is 
going to drive changes in brains that are in a simplifying and degrading direction. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. Now, it turns out that if you live on a cobblestone street, your balance is better, your cardiovascular system is better, a lot of things about your health and vigor, mentally and physically, are better because each time you take a little step, you have to make adjustments. And you have to make those adjustments continually, and so does your cardiovascular system. It has to change the way it pumps its blood a little bit. What we look for is the paved street. We're looking for easy street. We're looking for a smooth pavement. You know, life has got bumps in it. The world has got bumps in it. Natural world was not the paved street. All over Chinese cities, they have these mats or they have these black stones laid out in cities. People go up and they take their shoes off and they walk over these cobbles, little black cobbles, and that's putting information at the bottom of the feet, which is sending a signal up to the vestibular network to keep your balance better. So uncertainty is, a, is something that we not only have to deal with, it's something that we have to continue to train our brains to deal with because we're really interested in operating in the real world and not in a fake world in which everything is by the same rule. Our brains have to deal with variability in the environment, variability in life, variability in the problem, variability in the movement. And that's all about uncertainty and training the brain to deal with every contingency. Well, first of all, the cache, it says that it is 0.23 miles from here, so we've got about a quarter of a mile to go. Brian Roth is geocaching, a worldwide treasure hunt that combines the technology of global positioning systems, or GPS, the creativity of a worldwide community of geocachers, and the great outdoors. We're in Seattle, we're in Fremont, which is a really cool neighborhood, and we are near this beautiful canal, which is a, kind of a fun place to run or bike and geocache, certainly, which is exactly what we're doing. We've got 0.14 miles to go. He demonstrates how channeling the principles of peak performance into an activity can not only help your brain fitness, it's also getting people around the world off the beaten path. The first time I ever heard about geocaching, I thought it was dumb. I thought it was a dumb, geeky idea. Uh, then my wife, who was a little bit more, I think saw more of the potential in it, convinced me one day to get a GPS, handheld GPS unit, and to go look for a cache. And it took us to a forest, nature preserve, about a mile from my house that I never knew existed. Beautiful, big, beautiful forest preserve. And in the ensuing months, as we looked for more geocaches, we just found all of these beautiful places that we never even knew existed. So for me, it was a process of discovery. It was learning about the, the world around me in, in ways that I never would have had a chance to otherwise. A lot of people out there just, they were looking for an outlet to get some exercise or get them to do something different. And some people use it as a way to be social. So there's not a lot of pressure, you know? So I think it's open to everybody. And, and as a result, you have like a really friendly community of people. Geocaching combines an array of skills that your brain and body crave. Because it's a game, it's designed to be rewarding, which is important for brain change. It's a physically active endeavor, so it helps with cardiovascular health. And it forces you to pay attention, often by making the geocacher reassess their own familiar surroundings, viewing them through a completely different lens. It uses billions of dollars worth of satellite technology and, and computer and internet technology to get you out in the woods to find a piece of Tupperware. You know, it's, uh, people say that, the, that technology and, and the internet is forcing us indoors. In fact, the opposite is happening. Through pursuits like this, the internet is actually bringing us outdoors again. It's bringing us out into groups, introducing us to other people. This is not a solitary game. This is a social game. I probably had a handful of friends prior to geocaching, and I can safely say that I can call easily a couple of hundred people my friend. You go to geocaching events and you end up meeting more people. The socialization behind it uh, just really develops without you even trying. So what is it about geocaching that changes people's lives? I think it's the sense of accomplishment. It is the, the challenge of, of finding something, of completing a, a, a process, a solution, solving a puzzle, and then there's something at the end, something you can hold in your hands. You can say, I found this. This is an accomplishment. I plugged in the address of this uh, hotel, and uh, it told me that there was one within 75 feet of us. 
the uh, hint that I located says it's on top of the lot, so we probably have to get on top of the parking lot here in order to be able to locate it. Well, chances are, what I'm looking at here is going to be in one of these holes. So what I'm feeling for is a small container. Our brain is seeking continuous challenge. It's seeking novelty. It's seeking new experiences. It's seeking that new path. It's also basically asking us to retain our fundamental engagement with a natural environment. Each cache is a new experience, and I have to really think through that experience and approach it in a new way. One of the reasons I love, I love road trips in geocaching, because I explore new places and it keeps me thinking, exploring, being interested in my surroundings, and learning, I learn something new every time I go out caching. You know, whether it's um, something new about a community or a location, or a new interesting hide style for a cache. But it keeps me active and moving and really engaged in my surroundings. Dick and Arlene Fally are in their 80s and have geocached in every state in America. The physical activity that accompanies geocaching is critical to Arlene. I had both the rheumatoid and osteoarthritis when I was in my 30s. And my philosophy was, if I ever sit down, I just freeze in place, and I've kept very, very active all my life. And I read an article here a while back, and I picked up an arthritis magazine, and I didn't even know they had them, in uh, some doctor's office. And it was talking about that now they have decided that keeping active is the most important ingredient. And, and that's my philosophy, keep moving. Because a worldwide community continually creates and updates caches, there are an ever-expanding universe of possible finds, and each cache is rated based on the difficulty of locating it, so the challenge can escalate gradually. Caches can be almost any size, and sometimes even any shape. This keeps a level of uncertainty that engages the brain as well. You have no idea what you're looking for, so after you experience a bit more finding things, and you see, okay, yeah, this looks like it would be good for this type of size cache. This is what I may be looking for. Does geocaching make you smarter? I certainly think it makes you more alert. You have to have your senses about you. I think for older people, this is particularly true. You have to be aware of the hazards that are around you, uh, of the clues as to whether you're in the right area to find what you're looking for. It's not really about finding these little game pieces out in the woods or in town. It's about finding the locations where they're hidden. Um, and sometimes it's all about the hide. You'll find one that's a really clever hide, but usually it's because they found a great place that they want to show you. And I always say that that is the real hidden treasure in geocaching is the locations you're taken to. It's a game without competition. You know, and we're accustomed to thinking of games as having winners and losers. There are no losers in geocaching. So we're in the right place, and that's geocache. A lifetime of adventure for free. Over time, daily habits become our refined skills and abilities and translate into our expertise. But by utilizing the principles of peak performance, you can drive these skills forward no matter your age or experience. Attention is a critically enabling factor in what you can learn. When we pay attention, the brain releases chemical neurotransmitters that enable brain change. You can think of them as on-off switches. When you're attending, the brain is switched on neurochemically. Perception is influenced by our attention, but there are two types of attention. One type of attention is our goal-directed attention, and that's what we're going to define as top-down. That's the attention that you choose, the focus of what your goals are in your mind. Then there's the other type of attention. That's the attention that's imposed upon us, the attention that comes driven into us by the environment. So as an example, you're walking through Times Square and your goal is to get to the theater to see the show that you're almost late for. But while you're walking there, although the, those are your top-down goals, there's lots of bottom-up distraction around you. Interesting activities going on on the streets, signs being flashed at you. So you have this interaction between your top-down goals to attend and to get to your location and this incredibly robust bottom-up information that's pulling you away from your goals. It's competing with your the goal of getting to the theater on time. Controlling what your brain attends to 
determines what change will occur. Prediction within the brain is governed by the principles of neuron behavior. This idea, first theorized by neurobiologist Dr. Donald Hebb in 1949, is often summarized by the statement, neurons that fire together, nearly simultaneously in time, wire together. Hebb's contribution was to make the first baby steps toward showing that our experiences can leave indelible imprints in the brain, in this case, stronger synapses, and that's what underlies all of learning. Again, when you're exposed to something over and over again, the synapses that represent that, that vision, that something that you've heard, become stronger, and they become permanent memories. It's not just dramatic things that cause your brain to change its structure. Uh, and its function. It's things that you're doing all the time. If you do something repeatedly and you increase it incrementally, that's how you get major lasting brain change. The brain is also continually setting models of where learning is heading and remembering from moment to moment where you are in the progression of the development of any skill or ability and it evaluates that progression against the model that is held in memory. So in other words, I have a notion in my memory about what I'm trying to do. I know I'm trying to hit that ball. I know what I want to do. I know right where I want to hit it. Now I hit it and I evaluate what the outcome is, but the brain has this magical way of doing it. It just says all of those complex combinations of things, those 101 things that require just to do that, save them. The brain seeks the novel, asking for new challenges to conquer. These are the keys to motivating a brain and driving peak performance. Motivation underlies all learning, and it's perhaps the most underappreciated feature. I mean, we don't live in a neutral world, and it's important to realize we all operate off of reinforcement. The fact that you've developed expertise in how you operate in language, reading, or any tasks at your job, all reflect a slowly acquired product of massive specialization. If you don't in some way practice these abilities, you are in decline. There are some general heuristics about how to keep these, these skills sharp. And the number one rule is to be active, because active and being having an active lifestyle puts yourself inherently into unpredictable situations. So it really keeps your mind sharp and having to handle and successfully deal with not just one task at a time and not just one task repeatedly every day, but to deal with a myriad of different tasks uh, that really keep you challenged. So keeping yourself active and putting yourself into non-predictable situations, non-routine situations is really key in terms of keeping the brain sharp. Doing any kind of activity is clearly good. It has psychological value. It has self-worth issues. So I think there are a lot of more elementary psychological reasons why one should encourage that sort of thing. We're all really massively specialized and we've mastered a whole rich variety of abilities that defines us. And how can we retain those abilities? We have to continue to practice. Now if you don't continue to practice in things that matter to you, guess what? They're going to matter to you less and less and less because you're going to be less and less capable of sustaining them. You have to practice in all of those elemental ways that basically help you sustain those abilities which define you as the powerful and interestingly specialized person that you are. And that's why brain exercise, your brain fitness is very much your responsibility a part of what you must do to maintain high ability as long as you can in order to sustain a richer, older life. The power to change our brains throughout our lives was once thought to be completely impossible, but it's now an accepted scientific fact. Neuroplasticity is in fact the brain's default position. Purposeful and conscious effort drives our brain's plasticity forward. This directly impacts the way that we engage with the world around us. If we undertake tasks that invigorate our brains, engage us socially, and keep our bodies healthy and active, we can remain the masters of our lives.
We can expand our view of the world and combine the wisdom of our years with the unending joy of discovery as we harness the power of our brain's plasticity, helping us reach our own peak performance.